was our attempt. So if everything is small or has shrunk in the building, um, we try to supersize other things, like the windows and the bricks, because we did not want the building to feel like uh, a kit of uh, Lego pieces that are stacked, um, which in fact they were. Um, so the other component to the story is that they were built um, with modular construction in a factory in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And this image that you're seeing is basically the assembly line. So um, in the uh, upper right is the kind of initial stages of the, the unit. You can see the steel chassis, um, steel with concrete on top chassis. And then as it moves um, down the assembly line and loops back, it becomes more and more finished and more and more um, uh, finishes and fixtures are added onto it so that by the time it leaves the assembly line, everything is in place. All the structure, well, the structure is, is actually um, embedded in the walls themselves. Um, but all the light fixtures, all the plumbing fixtures, um, everything, all, all, the, all the paint has already been um, installed, the windows, the insulation, everything except for the brick and the appliances. And so at night, the modules are shipped and they stacked maybe three or four a day. It was quite a hair-raising uh, process. Um, they literally kind of slot into steel tabs that are uh, welded to the post from below and then the one that comes above it slots into it. The stacking process took about three and a half weeks. It's 55 units, 55 apartment units, um, but the core, the um, elevator and stair core is also a prefab unit. So there's about 67 actual prefab units. So that is the stacking and then after that all the brick comes. This is a plan of each unit um, and this is um, of the, of the um, residential floors. So you can kind of see maybe that the unit is the apartment plus a little bit of the corridor. And what you can maybe also see is that all the plumbing is on the corridor side for access. What happens when you stack it is that you get double wall and double ceiling and floor uh, situation, which you can see on this section and then in the plan. When they stack, they, it, it produces this double wall. This is important actually because there was a lot of anxiety about the project. Um, the neighborhood, the community groups, etc., were wondering, are we going back to SROs? Is this a dormitory? Are these transients, etc.? But the construction of it um, is actually incredibly solid and redundant, that the, the double wall and, and double floor, but also it minimized the noise, the construction noise on site. So rather than two years of construction noise on site, it was one year. And it was actually, the, the, other than foundations, it was quite quiet because after they stack, really it's um, the tie-ins that, that happen and the, the brick laying. So this is the typical floor plan. Um, and you can kind of get a sense that it's really a building of kitchens and bathrooms because even though it's micro, we are still complying to all the accessibility um, regulations, etc. And in New York, there are minimum sizes for living spaces, of course, minimum sizes for bathrooms, etc. So it's quite dense um, in terms of all, all of that. And what we had hoped is that it's a really kind of um, very kind of intense social um, interactive building um, because you're in such proximity to your neighbors, but you don't hear your neighbors. Um, and you can actually fit a 12-person dinner party inside. So on the inside, um, the, the strategy was you know, very basic architectural principles of maximizing the, the lights, maximizing the ceiling height, and allowing for the, all the functions to overlap with transformable furniture. So the ceiling height is actually nine, nine, eight. 
um, which is quite a bit larger than your um, typical eight foot minimum. So that is an important equation because we shrank the floor plate from 400 to 300. But if you think about the volume, if you think about the typical um, new uh, uh, unit that is an eight foot ceiling, we only shrank the volume by 10%. So the units feel quite big. All the windows are eight foot um, sliding windows. And so the connection from the interior to the exterior is really direct. Um, and that is our point that the micro-living concept really relies on the infrastructure of the city, and the building is conceived as part of the physical infrastructure, the social infrastructure, um, and it really connects to the activity of the street and the neighborhood. So this project has really garnered a lot of um, um, uh, attention to the very concept of um, the micro unit. I'm not here to say that micro units are the end all be all of housing. Um, the the um, nonprofit think tank that did all the research about the demographic shift, um, the micro unit was one of the unit types that they were advising the city to look at. The others were annexes and, um, and um, kind of, um, uh, um, convertible apartments, kind of acknowledging that as families expand and then contract again, so should your apartment, potentially. Um, so this building, it's 55 units, 40% is affordable. The affordable units are um, handled by lottery through the housing department. Um, out of those, so from, from 55 units, there's um, 14, 14, no, 22 are affordable. Um, eight of those went to formerly homeless veterans. That leaves 14 for the public lottery. For those 14, there were 60,000 applications. And I'm mentioning this because it's really alarming, um, and it really just points to the dire need for a really great diversity of housing types and of housing units, um, which is um, for us, um, so, you know, for, for us, it's, it's um, not just about thinking about, you know, housing as in the studio, the one bedroom, the two bedroom, the three bedroom, but in um, kind of following this project and, and in our studios with our students, we're really trying to think about, you know, why is it that housing is so rigidly defined um, by what the domestic unit is? And can we rethink how we define what a domestic unit is? So typically, the domestic unit equals the physical unit, the, the, the one bedroom or the, the two bedroom. Can we decouple that from the programmatic unit, for example? Program is a list of amenities and need not necessarily be equated to the physical unit. Program can be atomized and networked. The social unit is not the nuclear family and is never fixed. Families grow and then shrink again. So why are we fixating on um, a particular kind of unit for um, the, as the end all be all for families? Social units are extremely elastic and are always changing. The shared economy has taught us that amenities, functions of daily life and of the daily work life are constantly um, uh, changing as well. There are atomized meeting spaces, atomized sleeping spaces, atomized showers. All, all of these functions of daily life have become these microeconomic units that are dispersed through cities. And so can we think beyond the labels of housing types or housing units towards a more aggressive uh, uh, and proactive um, uh, strategies that really think about the amenities, the actions, and the performance of these spaces rather than the definition of their physical unit. This is something that we're thinking about in terms of the domestic space of cities, but also how we work in cities. So I want to just 
show you something um, that for us is very related, which is a workspace that we um, just finished. It's called ADO. It was for BMW Mini, but there are no cars. Um, it was designed as a workspace that also has a restaurant, um, retail, maker space, um, classroom, etc. Because car companies realize that, especially in cities and especially your age group, people don't necessarily buy cars in dense um, environments. And so many car companies are kind of, you know, trying to think about how to provide platforms for innovation and design and thinking about cities rather than just producing cars. So this is um, the project that we just finished. It's kind of a kind of um, ideal studio program in a way. Um, startup accelerator, design library, workspace, restaurant, retail. The idea is that work and um, the kind of associated functions kind of um, creates a, um, an ecosystem that is very different from um, how we used to think about work and how the city used to zone work. So this is the existing um, um, a warehouse building that we renovated in a manufacturing district. So this is a typical scenario of a single-use um, uh, building and a single-use neighborhood that the city is now rethinking in order to um, keep manufacturing but to embed other functions with manufacturing districts. And so ADO is simultaneously a restaurant, um, an event space with uh, um, um, guest uh, architects. This is um, Assemble from uh, London doing, doing a piece inside here. A retail space, um, the only um, that we know of free co-working space in the city, co-working and event space. And so this kind of remixing of program also informed the way in which we approach the kind of the physical building, the, um, which we called a kind of remixing of old and new. So all the windows were actually for, formally um, were, were there, we just expanded them and made them a lot larger. And so we took out all that graffiti brick, but we used it again to reframe all the openings. And we call it reconstituted graffiti. Somehow keeping the old, but remixing it with the new. Similar um, strategy, the periscope, which is a really big skylight that um, um, is at the, uh, right at the entry. It takes the views of Midtown Manhattan and the views of Brooklyn and combines it into the soffit of the skylight. You're actually looking at the mural of the roof, rooftop. And in that way, remixing bits of the city into the space and destabilizing what the boundary of the space is what the, uh, the kind of the territory of a workspace is, and in that way, trying to make this link between micro and macro. The micro moves that the architect does and ways in which we can intervene and contribute to the larger um, forces um, that are working in the city, such as policy and zoning and how we build cities. Thank you. Uh, recovering this year a format that we had explored uh, the, the, for the first uh, techno glass series, which is actually to have short lectures followed by discussions, uh, moderated discussions, and then uh, uh, questions open to, to the to audience. So I invite our panelists today. We have uh, Terence Riley, who is. Uh, a uh, partner in Keenan Riley, uh, practice based in New York and uh, Miami. Also was the uh, director of the Miami Art Museum and also the Philip Johnson chief curator of architecture and design at MoMA. And also a visiting professor this term with us starting, your studio starts in... October um, 23rd. October 23rd. And uh, 
Carrie Penabad is one of ours and uh, also a partner in Curie Penabad, a practice based in uh, Miami. So I'll open with a question, but uh, feel free, Terry and uh, Carrie, to intervene. So, uh, Mimi, thank you for the for the wonderful lecture, and uh, you you made a very good argument made a very good argument about how the changing demographics actually may point to the re invention and reconstitution of the uh, living unit. But also, you mentioned oh, this more volume. He's asking for. Oh, maybe it's just. So the, 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 the demographic argument is very clear, but also you mentioned how the sharing economy may also play the role in, in reformulating the, the housing uh, question. Could you perhaps elaborate a bit more on that? Uh, the, the, the argument goes something like this. Um, if, you're, if, if you're going to shrink well, our argument, if you're going to shrink footprint, what should you give back? And so part of that is you should give back more light and air than you're required to. You should give back more ceiling height, et cetera. But you should give back in terms of, you know, how, what, um, um, if the, the, the area that you took away, arguably a, um, a larger kitchen, a larger living space, et cetera, you should put back somewhere else in the building. And so somewhere else in the building, um, on, the, on the roof terrace actually, is a large salon with a larger kitchen. Um, there's other social spaces, there's a gym, et cetera. So it's about kind of dispersing those functions, um, not as your own, but as part of the shared um, functions of the building. And this is something that, you know, it's, it's not just about millennials. Um, this discussion is uh, prevalent in um, talking about uh, elderly living situations or um, empty nesters. The desire to um, be in dense urban environments um, because actually the value of interacting socially with others is higher than um, having that two-car garage or that, you know, McMansion. So, do you, the examples you mentioned also they remind me of the some of the experiments that were done with, you know, uh, Soviet housing that emphasized the communal spaces, etc. Yes. But is there, what is different about what you're doing and the sharing economy? different from those uh, utopian socialist schemes that actually valued, invested in community? It's very much in dialogue with that, albeit for a developer, for a commercial developer. Um, I would say that there, because it's not part of a kind of a public initiative like the, the Soviet examples and also Vienna, um, Austria has very strong social housing. But these are very, you know, very specific to that culture and it's um, generally driven by a kind of public um, social housing initiative. We don't have that. Um, and so what I find is that, of course, it's, it's developer driven and it's um, 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 kind of organized, curated by um, companies that are providing these amenities, that are doing it in a way that is um, not just, you know, a, one building, but actually a network of buildings, so that, and, and they're bringing um, networking events, cooking classes, yoga classes, etc. They're bringing it to the buildings, to the shared spaces of the buildings, as a way to get people to interact. You know, I think that I actually wrote an article that included this project. Um, it also included the concept that's referred to as share housing, mm -hmm. which is group housing, uh, co-housing, which is people who uh, develop their own building, uh, and um, 
One of the things that was very interesting, you talked about the importance of the social uh, dimension. Um, virtually all the main U.S. cities, Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, um, uh, Boston, all of them have seen a decline in the population of the suburbs. Um, and I think there's a fundamental change in generational change. Uh, I remember when I graduated from uh, undergrad, all the, uh, there was a, a bar called Senior Bar, which everybody went to. And uh, at the end of the year, uh, if you brought in a rejection letter, they would pin it up on the wall and you would get a free drink. And for many of my colleagues, many of my classmates, this was traumatic because if you were a lawyer, you fully expected to spend your entire career at the law firm that you start with. Same for bankers, same for a whole range of professionals. Where they started was a sign of where they would go. And so it was traumatic. Uh, you all will probably have a dozen jobs uh, in your career. And um, one of the things about the sociability of, these, of this situation or co-working, et cetera, et cetera, is um, where do those jobs come from? Where does that information come from? Uh, if you're in an ice, the more isolated you are uh, individually, the more isolated you are professionally. And I think it's, it's become a part of the, a very critical dynamic uh, in terms of staying involved, staying uh, connected, et cetera. Um, I want to point out uh, one other thing. It's not just on the lower income scale. A uh, hundred years ago, uh, a wealthy artist I know, it sounds funny. A uh, wealthy artist in New York got a few other wealthy artists, and they created what is, was called a syndicate at the time. And um, they hired an architect, and they designed a building. The, 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 the architect designed a building for them. And they were going to have the top... Uh, they all had custom apartments in the top half of the building. And then in a, in a stroke of amazing, oh, and the, and the theme of it was they wanted a building that was, they referred to it as a living club, where everyone that lived in the building would be an artist or involved in the arts. And so to equalize it, though, the bottom half of the building was uh, designed as uh, these very beautiful single bedroom, double height studio spaces for living and making art. And they were all rented to artists who couldn't afford uh, their own home. So, I mean, it was an amazing mix of incomes and aspirations, uh, and the, the mix was not about income, it was about interest in the arts. Mm -hmm. And um, what's incredible, the one thing that was similar between the small studios and the larger artists' apartments was neither of them had what you, we would call a proper kitchen. They had uh, larders you know, for storing food, for making coffee, things like that. Because you were expected to eat with everybody else, lunch and dinner, in the big dining room. And it was all about sociability. Mm -hmm. And th even though it, uh, it was economically on a much different scale, the idea was that this sociability was actually more important than solitude and separation. I can't imagine I can't imagine it happening today. I mean, I, I, just, I just don't think society, I mean, it, you know, McMansions are all about the opposite of that idea. No sociability, everything happens in the house, uh, and, and so on. So it's not just a, it's an interesting thing to, to scale up. I mean, I think... Um, oh, it's the Hotel des Artistes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, because land is far less expensive, there are similar um, um, groups like that in Berlin. Um, they're called Baugruppen, mm -hmm. build, builders groups, um, where you know a, a collective of like-minded people will get together and create this kind of co-living situation. Um, in New York, it tends to be developer-driven because mm. of the cost of the land. But well, well, the way that works, though, is not is potentially replicable. I mean, um, yeah. if you take a bunch of not gen, uh, not millennials, but Gen Xers who are maybe in their mid-30s, 
and have been saving up for a down payment on an apartment, what these groups do is, you know, find an affinity group. Yeah. They use what would be their down payments for a developer apartment to buy a piece of land, mm -hmm. and then the land becomes collateral to get the building loan. And uh, the city assists this, um, but that's not impossible to think uh, that it couldn't be replicated. Um, how the whole thing would happen right. and the architect's role and yeah. the idea that everybody wants an indie, unique apartment, it would, it would have to be a group of people who knew how to work together. Yeah, I, w I was just going to say, I, I think you're bringing up, you know, um, uh, maybe another slide, w which is about um, ownership mm -hmm. and the structures of ownership and, and how we can kind of think a little bit more flexibly about that. I mean, of course, there's Airbnb, but that, that's not that interesting in, in a way. But when it comes to the ownership of home, um, that it's a little bit of an apart of your apartment, a little bit of a studio, a little bit of a kitchen elsewhere. Um, that, that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. And but yes, it has to be like-minded people. Uh, uh, you mentioned, you know, talk, we're talking about the same thing, this co-housing, and you know, one of the things that makes it work is. It takes the whole profit incentive out of the process. And I don't know if any of you have worked for developers. They want profit. They want to make a lot of money. So if we're talking about an eight-story building with 10 apartments, um, one, uh, developers won't build those things. Right. But if you take away what the developer would want, all of a sudden the budget for the project is, is quite spectacular. Mm -hmm. Actually, I. I I could maybe add to some of the comments, and as I look up at the room, I see a pretty large number of third-year students in particular, who, which are currently working on the topic of housing, and I think the micro-housing unit um, is really one of a number of solutions to deal with mass urbanization um, today. So first I wanted to thank you. Um, being um, both in practice and also in academia, it's formidable to be able to build a building in the heart of New York City, testing a brand new prototype. And I guess I wanted to um, maybe underscore what I view to be a really important aspect of the success of the project, which is really the development of this robust kind of sequence of communal or public spaces, which I guess has been said before. And maybe if you could tell us a little bit more about what criteria you use to be able to develop even the program for some of that. Um, did it involve the community? Was it self-generated by you and the developer? And then maybe a follow-up to that would be, I think, do you think it would be an anomaly? Because, for instance, I've seen some micro-housing units where they have eliminated the public realm in large part, packing in the units which could maybe adversely turn into a sort of tenement-like condition. Right. So it seems that the, the success of the micro-housing relies on that careful balance between a relatively robust sequence of public spaces offset by a number of individual units. So I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit, because yours is a, is a special project in the sense that it was a competition, and it was supported by the government, and Bloomberg was involved. So. Maybe you can speak to that a little bit more. Right. So we were very lucky because it was a competition, and the way that these competitions work, it, it wasn't just a design competition. It was a, an entire pro forma. Um, so the developer had um, to um, show all the financials behind it. Um, design was one tab in a multi-tab <laughs> um, submission. Um, and because it was a competition, um, public competition, what we showed had to be built, which is very, very different than how it typically is done. So for example, those eight foot windows that are in every unit, there are eight foot windows in the fire stair, which never happens, ever. Um, but we showed it um, during the competition and therefore it's you know, it's in, it's, it's written in stone. So we were very lucky in, in that aspect. Um, in terms of the shared spaces, we um, went around um, to look with the broker and the developer to look at compar 
you know, no, there was nothing really like it, but to look at other new buildings and to look at what is typically being built in terms of the shared spaces. Um, and, and also, you know, looking carefully at the demographics of the neighborhood and, um, you know, analyzing who um, they were projecting to live in there. Um, so it's it's not very complicated. Um, really, the 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 battle that we won um, was where we put them, um, because typically, you know, the gym is dank and in the basement, and all these things are kind of you know in the less desirable areas. Um, but because of the nature of the competition, um, they were more front and center. Um, Part of the competition, though, was also to try. My understanding, at least the mayor's position, was to try to change the rules so that developers were actually more interested yes. in building smaller units. Do yes. you think, from your experience... Developers are always interested in that. <laughs> what? No one has to convince a developer to build smaller units. Developers are always interested in that, <laughs> which um, which is part of Carrie's the, the last point. Um, yes, I worry a lot about... Uh, you know the the fallout of something like this um, because um, yeah of course developers want to sh cram as many people in as possible but no in to, terms of the whole thing this formula yeah including the mass production I guess right, uh, right. smaller but taller uh, mass production yeah enough public spaces to offset the does, do you think the whole developer package for doing what you did is going to be repeated? So that was the former mayor. Mm -hmm. The current administration has not approved micro units as of right, which means that it's um, a case by case. They are mm -hmm. worried about what I mentioned. They're worried that um, it will um, be abused. Um, by developers, um, and they're worried about um, transient population, et cetera, um, and, and all, all of these things, SRO, et cetera. Um, so they have not approved it as of right. Um, it's the, I think for a while, the only 100% micro unit building. They are considering adding micro units as a mix, which I think is actually better. Um, as one of the mix, so you know the micro unit, the one bedroom, etc. It's part of the mix um, to create more diverse f um, communities, more diverse households within a building. Um, they have um, so there's like two aspects of the project that um, that the the city was considering. One part is the micro, and the other part is modular. Um, they have, in order to encourage people to build with modular construction, they have allowed for um, a little bit of leeway for the redundant walls and floors. Um, so, but still, it's a case by case scenario. And honestly, we we lucked out. We couldn't add another floor, um, so we lucked out with the tall ceilings. I don't know if we will luck out with the with the next one. Did um, who? Uh, I mean, I was amazed about the the prefab, and um, for you guys to tackle this whole project and also talk about prefab, is it, did you work with a company that understood your design and helped you figure out how you slice it into pieces and how you drop it into place? Yes. We've come a long way since PS1, since Bamboo. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, I like PS1 too. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we, um, you know, pre the prefab part um, was uh, um, a given because the developer was also the same um, person who started the prefab company and is also the same person who um, uh, has a construction company. So it was developer, GC, prefab company all in one. Yeah. So we actually started the competition by looking at their standard details. Day one, we, we said, okay, you know, they, they first invited us and, and they said, can you, you know, can you make it prefab? And so we started the competition by looking at their details, which is not how we typically start com um, competitions, but we really, you know, wanted to um, 
kind of think about the the sequence um, of that um, from the very beginning. Um, what was I going to say? I forgot. Yeah. Um, we were not the only ones to mm -hmm. um, propose prefab, actually. Um, I think that there, there might have been a few, um, but it was definitely um, it, it was definitely a positive point for the city, given the sensitivity of the public housing that was all around us. I mean, I think the, you, the way in which you answer the questions, I think, is also um, refreshing because uh, I think that sometimes we come with these preconceived ideas about architectural agency today, what it means to work with the developers, and we place labels on things, or we think about not being able to begin a design process with actually an analysis of a series of details. But in hearing you present and even listening to the, your answer to the questions, I find that the answers are liberating because actually design, powerful design can come in many ways, and I think whether it be collaborations with individuals that you didn't originally expect, or whether you could begin a process studying it from a very almost uh, dry, even technical detail, mm -hmm. and I think develop a work that has meaning. I think is, you know, is inspiring. Yeah. And so, I, I didn't want to go off the topic, but I kept thinking. I mean, we've been talking about the spaces, but I think one other aspect, as you were presenting, that I was curious about is that I think contemporary technology permits us to have these micro units, right? Because you can have an entire la library on your Kindle, or you can, um, you know, you don't have the CDs any longer, your entire music yeah. library is on an iPhone, or, I mean, we can go through this. Um, but it seems also uh, the dip Carrie, you introduced me to that app that uh, yes. allows you to manage your laundry, right? Oh. Somebody <laughs> It's yes. like Uber for... Right, or for you can do <laughs> apps with laundry so that Uber so. comes and picks up your laundry. So, all I mean, right. there's all... Technology allows us to, in theory, declutter, perhaps. Um, well, <coughs> that, this is the happy side of that story. Yes. But another part, you know, this is America. Um, we've seen the proliferation of the, the McMansion. True. And... Um, What's really interesting is uh, a study was done that even as the moment McMansions proliferated, so did storage units. Mm -hmm. Storage units are one of the largest growing building types in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you realize that people are building McMansions, uh, even as they're, they have smaller families, um, and then they have to have a storage unit because they just have so much stuff. You know, they have so much stuff. And when I think about that kind of living versus the living you're all talking about where things are kind of disappearing. Well, it would seem to me that what Terry's talking about is really a condition of the suburbs. And actually in Miami, we were well versed in the, in the concept of the Mac Mansion. I think the micro housing is really a product of an incredibly dense city and actually micro housing units are also culturally relevant in the case of new york they're 250 to 350 you were saying in hong kong they're half that size mm -hmm. and they're not even called tiny you were saying earlier in an earlier conversation in texas they're like 550 mm -hmm. so size is also relative but i guess one thing i was thinking about regarding technologies did you have any direct relation or direct role in designing the transformable furniture um, because it seems like that is also critical, and I was just curious if these were, you know, stock items, or since you were talking about prefabrication, like what role did your firm play in the sort of furnishings, the kind of transformable, transformable furniture that makes living in these tiny spaces that are, let's say, decluttered because of presumably technology possible. So right. I was just curious. Um, the furniture is not ours, but we, you know, worked with the. Um, um, distributor to, to furnish the apartments. And in fact, um, originally the developer was not planning to furnish anything, um, just the show uh, apartment. And so we, we you know, furnished the show apartment, we selected everything. Um, but then the furniture company decided to donate that furniture for all of the home, uh, homeless vet apartments, hmm. um, which, which was amazing really, really amazing. But none of that is new, the transformable furn mm -hmm. furniture. None of, none of that is new. Um, it has, you know, all of this has been, you know, th th there's been a new, you know, a new breath for, um, um, for the um, kind of 
you know, thinking about modular, a new breadth for transformable furniture, none of it is really new. Of course, we have our own um, ob obsessions and inspirations that we're really drawing from. We were looking at Europe, of course, um, thinking about collective housing, um, social housing, um, looking at all of the, you know, experiments in the 30s, etc., um, and and kind of mining that. Um, so. Yeah, and I, and I just um, in terms of McMansion, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. But when we were when we first started the project and we were looking at all this data, I'm pretty sure it has shrunk a little bit. Wow, the average um, since since the recession. Yeah. But I, I think that that is you know the the other kind of um, factor that you know this all this discussion about the sharing economy, um, the fact that people. Some people own less things, um, and do not want to own cars, do not want to own uh, record, record collections, CDs, books, etc. Um, that is part of it. But also, part of it, I think, was a reaction to the excess of um, the early knots um, and a kind of sobering um, uh, kind of uh, wake-up call um, after post-recession. I mean, you must have also in all of your research and just the running up against the codes and stuff perhaps been a little surprised at how much the government is interested in how you live yes. um, most everybody who's lived it, most of the young people here have lived in dormitory they've lived in their private homes but then they've adapted to dormitories and in some cases rented houses with roommates um, in Miami if there's more than four unrelated adults it's a group home and uh, a group home, which sounds like an appealing concept for housing, uh, is only for the mentally ill, the elderly, uh, infants, or ex drug addicts and ex-criminals. I mean, this whole idea that the government thinks sharing a domestic space is absolutely unacceptable in some social way, unless you have a medical or some reason for doing so. Um, what did you run up against that most surprised you about what the government expects in terms of how we're supposed to live? So in New York, that similar code is three. It is illegal for three unrelated adults to live together in New York, which is this completely arcane law. Of course, it's you know to prevent brothels, but it makes zero sense now, um, um, and people break that law all the time. So that um, and that surprisingly um, did not get changed with the latest zoning um, uh, amendment for for some reason. That was it. Still remains the most bizarre one. Um, and speaking of the government really paying attention, we got very scary a very scary letter from the Department of Justice telling us um, w with a list of codes that we had to make sure to comply with um, because they were worried about what we were doing um, and they wanted to make sure that we were still complying with all the accessibility, et cetera, et cetera. So that is another reason for the modular. We were, um, in some places, we were down to an eighth of an inch tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, to meet the minimum room dimensions, which is not possible with traditional construction. Um, and if we went over, then we would lose a line of apartments, and mm. that would be terrible for, so, yeah, the Department of Justice, that was a, that was a new one. <laughs> Amazing. Sorry, I, I jumped in before you. No, I think maybe we should now open it to the questions from the audience. No, we can continue yeah, here. We can. We can hear you. Um, how would you respond to the idea that? people in New York or people in general that are not affluent or that do not have a lot of money can't live uh, minimalistically in these smaller spaces with less stuff because um, stuff has been made so 
uh, stuff isn't made to last like it used to. Like light bulbs have not been made to last. Other things have not been made to last. So people will collect things and not be able to live in this minimalistic fashion in these small spaces if they don't have a certain pay grade. I don't think that's true. Why? Why? I, I don't understand the connection between light bulbs. You mean because they need storage? Well, yeah. Space? So poor people tend to collect more things, and that um, living almost destitutely is more of a privilege for some people. I don't. I. I don't know if. I don't. Yeah. Well, I'm. I mean, I'm not really. I don't, I just don't, well, first of all, in dense um, urban environments, you're quite close to whatever amenity you need. Um, and for that reason, you know, New Yorkers are actually have a very, very small carbon footprint um, because we do not, we do not go to Costco. I love Costco, but um, I, I grew up. I grew up in the suburbs. Um, I, I know how to hoard, but um, you know we we don't have room for those things, um, and so we tend to buy our groceries every other day rather than you know once a week. Um, but it's also because it's possible because there are you know in your trajectory um, and on your block you know, places to buy food and hardware stores and et cetera, et cetera, to buy the things that you need. Um, I really don't think that it's about income level. Um, I think it's about, um, I mean, I, I know plenty of low income people who live very simply um, and partly because they are living outside of their apartment and really living in parks um, and living in the kind of public spaces um, that, that the city has and, and really socializing. I, I actually think about, you know, when you say collecting, I think about people who can afford to collect um, and who buy an, an unnecessary amount of stuff. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it, small doesn't, actually necessarily mean minimal either. Um, so I think that you're conflating a, a couple of different ideas. Um, the one thing that we have not been able to do that I really, really want to do, um, but the developer is protecting all the tenants, is I really want to contact the tenants and ask them to photograph um, how they've set up their apartment because I um, I do you know I really want to see that but we're not allowed to for privacy issues but that would be amazing. You can't contact them. No, maybe I'll just do it anyway. <laughs> I'll, I'll just have to skulk skulk around skulk around the um, the lobby. <laughs> it could be a student project. <laughs> they Thank get you a so lot much. of publicity, so they're trying to protect them. On my way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I, I love the project and I'm fascinated by it. And I'm, I'm just kind of struck by two things. One is a thought and one is a question. And one is, I find it so fascinating how as, as housing gets smaller and smaller, it tends to, um, uh, you, you know, affect as homes get bigger, they become about the individual, and as it becomes smaller, they really become a public issue. Um, and, and I think the product is a really great balance. My question was, as as you are approaching the problem, because I'm trying to think through the problem, so as you shrink, at what point, or, or I guess I'm curious, did you approach it as a kind of efficiency project where you begin to you know, shrink things, remove things? And at what point do you then begin to start to reconceptualize what is necessary, this new list of amenities that you mentioned? I'm thinking about 
this great exhibition I saw at the MoMA that had the Frankfurt Kitchen, I think it was called Counter Space, and it also showed, you know, the kind of evolution of the role of the kitchen in the domestic space. So it used to be a back of house thing, then it became, you know, really the central hearth of the space. And how were there like certain programmatic elements that really required, you know, extra effort to, to negotiate? I'd, I'd say that um, one of the challenges was, well, f first of all, the um, the reason why that plan looks like it's all kitchens and bathrooms is because those are the minimum sizes for kitchens and bathrooms that we have to meet. I love airplane bathrooms. Not an airplane bathroom at all. <laughs> um, they are accessible bathrooms. They are wheelchair. You know, you can wheel your chair into the shower. You could set up a work a home office in in the bathrooms comparatively in in some of those bathrooms um so in a sense we we didn't have that much wiggle room um but what we did try to do is that you know essentially your kitchen is in your living space which is also your sleeping space um and so you know the kind of the orientation of the conf kitchen the configuration um the transformability of certain things um to you know hide um the kitchen is is what we focused on and then you know when we started thinking about the furniture um everything kind of telescopes so the bed telescopes the coffee table goes from this height to that height so it goes from lounging to you know work um, the um, little credenza goes from one feet deep to um, eight feet deep um, so it's it's that kind of you know kind of scalability of functions from one person to to several that we thought about and then um, just you know, trying to sneak in wh wherever we could extra stuff. So the kitchen and bathroom um, is a lower ceiling height, and above that we put storage, which is about the cubic volume of a Volkswagen Jetta, a station wagon. <laughs> Um, sort of in contrast to the micro-housing concepts we've been talking about, I wanted to ask about your Hometa Anywhere USA project. Um, how does that project speak to cultural identity and the influence of design on that identity? What was the last thing that you said, the influence of design on, on, on that identity? Yeah. Okay, so thank you for doing your homework. Um, the Hometa project is uh, was a speculative house that we designed for um, a company that was um, hoping to sell house plans online, um, hoping to compete with Um, that are ready to go. You can just give them to your builder. Um, but all those companies actually sell very traditional houses, Tudor, Georgian, whatever. Um, and so this company, Hometa, approached us because they wanted to do the same thing but for contemporary houses. So um, it's, um, it's interesting that you ask about identity because it was meant to exist anywhere, anywhere USA. And so it's a very different concept of um, um, looking carefully at context. In this case, we had no context. So um, in a kind of a very different way of working, we um, were looking at you know, the most kind of generic size house, the most kind of generic situation, and trying to design something that could be adaptable to as many situations as possible. So it kind of has um, no identity. Thank you. Or it can assume any identity was, was the hope. Any other questions? Going back to the, the storage uh, issue and my initial question about the sharing economy, because maybe I wanted you to acknowledge that the, there is a difference between the, this, what you're dealing with, the situation now, and the experiments in social housing in Europe. Uh, and it really, I think it has to do with the technology. For instance, I just saw a, a, a service online that offers to pick up 
uh, things that you are not using a lot, like your bread machine or whatever. And then they will put it in a quote unquote cloud. So your object, your possessions could be in a cloud, just like your data is in the cloud. Those objects are in the cloud and then they can be shared with other people. So somebody who wants to use the bread machine, they can have yours. Uh, and because it's in the cloud, it can be shared. So even that's <laughs> so. It's like an online pawn shop. <laughs> <laughs> even like the storage space, which maybe is the most resist, the most material of all of these things we are talking about, is also dematerialized and is we can be conceived as a cloud, right? So. And I think that is very different, this condition where all your books and CDs, but also the things that you are putting in deep storage are all dematerialized. That's certainly a new condition that maybe, I, I, I suspect you were thinking about this because you did say at one point, you used the word networked to describe what you were doing. You said this is in the networked kitchen. So it's not only about being plugged into the communal resources of the neighborhood, but actually being uh, uh, also part of a, whole, a vast network yeah. of uh, logistics and resources that actually the technology enables these days. Absolutely, and, and there's a, I, I mean, I, I think there's a utopian and dystopian side to that. Um, uh, the the te what technology enables, and what is really interesting is that, you know, I think that what you're pointing to is what technology can enable, um, but the focus on physical space and and actually socially, you know, so socializing in physical space, um, in some ways, is trying to counteract um, what technology enables um, because people are really starving for physical um, connection with people. Um, I was just reading that um, a study has just come out that shows that teenagers nowadays are not experimenting with drugs or sex as much as they used to because they are on technology. They are just not in physical space and they are not experimenting with alcohol. All, all, of, the, all of those things that were raging <laughs> when we grew up um, that has declined because of the amount of time that they're actually interacting virtually, which I think is quite dystopian. Dystopian. Yeah. Well, not not the not. I'm not saying they should go out and drink and do drugs more, but the, the dystopian part is that you know we, we need to focus on these social, the physical social spaces more. There was an article in the New York Magazine this week. I don't know if you saw it. It was by, written by a mother about her um, child and how she is now co-parenting with some device. Uh, what's the thing on your iPhone, the woman's voice? Oh, oh Siri? Siri? It's, um, it's a much more sophisticated, and it's about the size of a speaker, and her child talks to it all day long, asks it questions, all sorts of things, and it... The question was, I mean, the article is all about how the mother feels about yeah. this new presence in their family because uh, it's become absolutely central to the family, to this raising of this child. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, the one thing that I, I, I got to come back to you about, that minimalism is expensive. I'm not, when, I, when you talk about minimalism that is, is powered by devices, by you know, getting rid of all your stuff because you have very expensive things, that kind of minimalism is expensive. If it's this whole business of I want less, mm -hmm. that's another sort of thing. And you know, it's interesting, it's happening also in suburbia. I'm sure you've seen all these articles about tiny houses, small houses. You know, it's like a, people finding sheer joy in moving from their huge house into something very small. Uh, governments hate those too. I mean, it's surprising how much the government thinks about how you should live. But uh, I think the, the 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 core of it is this um, social dimension. I think. I mean, I think it's the reason people come to cities in the first place, or once they come to cities, find it seductive and 
learn that they can't live without it, and whether it's um, for reasons of career, um, if it, if you know, I, I, I don't know if it's like a ideological Soviet-style notion about social interaction, but I think um, it's it's part of some cultures and it's alive in some of ours. Somebody once wrote that the entire you know Paris has very small apartments, and someone figured out that the entire population of Paris could fit into cafe into the city's cafes, like not sitting but standing up. But there was enough cafe space that the entire city could go there at once. And um, you know, when you live that way, that becomes like breathing. It's just well, thank you very much. I'm sure. I